Africa. The European political culture is not found in Africa. Well, I have some experience of Nigeria. In Africa, where politics is based upon corruption. It is not found in China. It is not found in Russia now, although it might have been 15 years ago. One question is, this is challenging, should the European political culture be spread? Indeed, is European political culture superior to other political cultures? And it is not popular, Chairman, to talk about whether something is superior to something else. I do believe that European political culture and its ideal is superior to others. That's challenging and you might want to ask me about that. There are difficulties. The rise of political culture from groups within Europe outside our political culture, the extreme right. The European Commission has no courage in leading application of our political culture. They're completely emasculated. The European Parliament is powerless, I'm afraid to say, Mr. Kempara. If Britain leaves in three weeks' time, it'll be a disaster for Europe and it might bring about an unraveling of our European ideal. However, if there is a large vote for Britain to stay in Europe, it could be the beginning of a renaissance for us all. And in that renaissance, we have to think about where this ideal lies that I, I've enunciated in the beginning. The ideal starting with the Sermon on the Mount and ending with Karl Marx. The highs of our European political culture are, I believe, Scandinavian society. Spain after Franco, Poland between 1989 and 2015, Germany since 1950, Iceland in the year 1000 AD, where the whole of the Icelandic population came together and voted whether to be Christians or remain pagans. Every man and woman had a vote. Italy in Garibaldi and his government in Turin, the way the Danes treated the Jews in the Second World War, and Helmut Kohl and Mitterrand at Verdun. Those are the highs of our culture. The lows have been the Spanish Inquisition, Nazism, <clears throat> martial law in Poland in December 1981, when my first visit to Poland was on the first day of that martial law in December and I had a most extraordinary experience about how Poles can behave in the face of injustice. Another low, the poetry of Gabriele D'Annunzio. But there are more, Christian, there are more highs than lows. And I think you have concentrated on too many lows. To the future for the European political culture, I agree with Mr. Kempara, lies in our European Union institutions, a absolutely. Do we need new political parties? We have Podemos and Ciudadanos in Spain, arisen in the last couple of years, both quite different, both very interesting movement. Do we need to get rid of our present political parties and make new ones almost impossible? But I believe that new political parties are possible, and I wondered with others, uh, Professor Sims in Cambridge, whether the university might not be a seat of generating new political parties because of the recognition by the people of the integrity of the university. I believe we need coalitions in government. We don't need political parties that are from one side or the other, as you have in Poland, as we have in the United Kingdom. We need more coalitions. We need politicians who are educated, who are not career politicians, but are educated in science and history and the humanities. We need to examine the Heineken plan for the future of Europe. 25 years ago, Heineken, who makes the beer, said, why don't we have a Europe where there is no power in Paris, Berlin, 
Warsaw, Madrid, or London, there is local power and local taxes to preserve local culture and a very strong center in Brussels to control foreign policy, general economics, and defense. And I believe that would be a European ideal I could fight for. The threats to our European ideal are a poorly regulated press, <clears throat> divergence in society through capitalism. Uh, have you all read Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century, 800 pages? I haven't read it, but I've read the introduction and the conclusions. He argues that the inheritance of capital in Europe is a destructive, divergent uh, cause of societal problems. Another threat is the control of our infrastructure by countries who don't have our own political culture, at the moment mostly China. Another threat, nostalgic nationalism, whether it's in Poland, in Spain, or in the United Kingdom. A lack of leadership from the European Commission, a lack of guts and courage from the European Commission to say this is the way we should go and a lack of offering of a moral destiny to citizens of Europe in parallel with economic growth. At the moment, all we are offered is economic growth. What we require is a moral destiny. So, Chairman, in summary, <clears throat> I believe we do have a European culture, which is unique. I believe that culture is superior you might ha have to ask me to define superior to many other cultures. We have a political tradition in the way that culture is applied, which at its best is noble, at its worst is destructive and only self-interested. On the whole, I think the good things in Europe and that political culture outweigh the bad things. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, John. It's uh, very challenging, and you're the only person who actually spoke as long as the maximum allowed. Um, well, th thank you, uh, Jacek. I'll now take over and allow you to speak. Th thank you very much, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, uh, I, I understand that most of you are students looking at the uh, age profile of the of the audience, um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be in Wrocław. I, I come to Wrocław far too little. Um, it's a beautiful city with a, a great deal of presence uh, and also a great deal of spirit. So uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, the, the subject of the talk is, is there such, is there a European political culture? And I think we were directed uh, the right way by, previous, by the previous speaker, by Professor John Martin, who stressed, well, yes, there's obviously a European culture. I mean, the, the first question is, is there a European culture at all? And I think the answer to that is pretty obvious. There is a European culture. It would be absurd to suggest that there isn't a European culture. We learn, we ought to learn, Caesar at school and Dante at school and... Uh, and Voltaire, and Proust, and, and we wouldn't do that. I mean, how many Chinese authors do we learn? Um, and how many Turkish authors do we learn? Maybe we ought to learn more, but we don't. Uh, America's moving slightly away from European culture because there's an incomprehensible prejudice against middle-aged white men, which I find totally unacceptable uh, in American academia. But the fact remains that there's still 80, 90 percent of what American students are taught is European and North American culture, and not the rest of the world. So given that there's European culture, it seems fairly likely that there's such a thing as European political culture. I think Christian Davies is absolutely right to say that we can't selectively pick the bits that we like. We can't cherry pick European culture. Um, th there's an old joke about, you know, what is the, um, what is the greatest, this is going to be very politically incorrect, but since the new wave of 
populism is against political correctness, I'll take a risk. What, is, what was the greatest PR success in the history of the world? It was convincing the world that Hitler was German and Beethoven was Austrian. Um, and obviously you can't cherry pick. You've got to take Beethoven and Hitler together if you want to talk about what your culture, both cultural culture and political culture are. And that applies just as much to um, talented, people who are talented to mus in music as, the, as it does to somebody like me who has a totally uh, wooden ear, as we say in Polish. So I think there is a political culture. Uh, there's a European culture. There's a European political culture. It's good. It has good bits and bad bits. Um, but the thing that I'm going to talk about uh, is what I think is most relevant today, and that is how is that European culture changing at the moment? Because I think we're, we can see it changing in front of our eyes. Of course, most dramatically uh, and most unexpectedly, maybe, in terms of the extent of the change here in Poland, but this is clearly a very widespread change right across what you might call the Atlantic European space, and I make no apologies using the term Atlantic, sorry, I said European, the Atlantic cultural space. I make no apologies using the term Atlantic cultural space. This is, after all, a Congress organized by the Atlantic Council. So, I'll want to talk about how that culture is changing, because it clearly is changing, why it's changing, and what the consequences of it changing will be. I said earlier that we have a, an Atlantic cultural space. Do we have an Atlantic political culture? Well, I think we do, and in order to prove that point, I shall quote Douglas Haig, who was taking part in the um, European referendum debate, the great Brexit debate, earlier on this year, and said the following, and I hope this works. No? How are we going to make this work? Okay. No? There we are. And Douglas Haig, as part of the Brexit, the European referendum debate, it's all right, okay. The European referendum debate, debate said, the Leave campaign is really the Donald Trump campaign with better hair. <laughs> and that shows that we really have, I mean, there are two aspects to this which suggest that, you know, we really have a European, uh, sorry, a, an Atlantic political culture. On the one hand, the statement itself, and secondly, the fact that he felt he needed, he could refer to the Donald Trump campaign. Um, and thirdly, mm, it's interesting that uh, uh, this statement was actually very much part of what the Brexiteers, the people who want Britain to leave the European Union, call Project Fear. Project Fear is the idea that, you sh that it's very unfair of the government to tell people that something which will lead to, a, to disaster is a bad idea. That's Project Fear. It was first used in the case of the Scottish referendum when the British government uh, told the Scots, um, you really can't rely on oil at $120 a barrel forever, which is what the Scottish government was assuming in all its economic projections. Um, Fortunately for the Scots, Scottish uh, Project Fear worked. Uh, they voted 55 to 45 to stay in the United Kingdom, and a year later, the price of oil was somewhere around $40 a barrel. The extraordinary thing is that the Scottish National Party, having brought Scotland so close to disaster, then went on to win almost every single seat to the Westminster Parliament in the elections of, of 1915, which is an important Another important indicator of what's happening to our culture, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. But Project Fear is, has been well-defined by the Brexiteers. 
uh, in the British context, I think we can uh, also say that this is a wider phenomenon. It's basically mainstream media trying to scare the population, trying to scare the voters with lies about how bad things will be unless they behave sensibly. And it's quite clear that this was part of Project Fear because I'll tell you again, I'll remind you again, the Leave campaign is really the Donald Trump campaign with better hair. Well, it turns out this was a lie. <laughs> Clearly, the Donald Trump campaign has the better hair. Um, there is... Uh, there are several interesting things about Donald Trump. The, probably the most important thing about Donald Trump, for me as an economist, is that Donald Trump, as you know, is refusing to uh, publish his tax returns. And there's a serious suspicion that the reason he doesn't want to publish his tax returns is not because he's been cheating on tax. It's because the tax returns would show that he's a lot less rich than he says he is that his net wealth, far from being seven or eight billion dollars, is probably about four billion dollars. Now that's actually quite serious, and he's admitted somewhere that in his calculations he includes four billion for the value of his, um, of his trademark, of the very fact that he is Donald Trump. Um, I should try that one, of my, one, one day. Um, but the interesting point that's been made by someone recently is that if Donald, Donald Trump inherited $200 million in the early 1980s from his father, uh, that's the way he made it up working 18 hours a day in the kitchen from, uh, from nowhere. Uh, he inherited $200 million from his father and had he invested them in just a classical index of uh, shares on the New York Stock Exchange, the Standard and Poor 500, he would today be worth something in the region of $16 billion. He's actually worth $4 billion. This is the great successful businessman who on the basis of that and on the basis of never having held public office is quite likely to become president of the United States. By the way, Warren Buffett also inherited $200 million in the early 1980s and he's worth $68 billion. But there we are. The thing about, uh, about Donald Trump is that he actually reminds me a little bit more, rather than of, Donald Tr of, uh, of uh, Warren Buffett, he reminds me a little bit of Catiline. If we go back to the Roman Republic, there was a, a bankrupt aristocrat who tried a coup uh, against the Roman Republic in, uh, on the basis of getting together all the people who'd been bankrupted and trying to overthrow not just the political system, but also the system of property rights. Um, certainly one of the ways in which um, European political culture is changing is that we can see what I would call the return of pure politics, red in tooth and claw. Um, in, in Polish, we only have one word, polityka. But in it, English has two words, politics and policy. Both of those are translated as polityka in Polish. But there's a fundamental difference between the two. And for 30 years during what was called the, the great uh, moderation, we had the spread of the area of life and also the geographical area which was run on the basis of policies and rules. And now what we've got is the, that area of life cr diminishing and cracks appearing in that area of life that is, has been run until now by rules and principles and um, things of that sort, and more and more and shifting towards or sort of uh, bits of bits of life being torn out of the out of the uh, kingdom of rules into what Marx called the kingdom of freedom, but in this case, the freedom is not necessarily going to be terribly uh, useful for us, in other words, the area where politicians can make decisions or Voters can make decisions, because it's also voters. But the problem is that those are areas where the decisions are subject to very often highly emotional debate, and where 
What will happen next is unknown because it will be on the basis of a political decision that is made. And I think that's one of the big things that's happening in European political culture. I was at a, a conference on Brexit in Budapest last, last, last week, last Friday. And there was, it was mostly Brexiteers that organized the conference. And what was extraordinary was how ex incredibly emotional they were uh, in, their, in their statements. Um, and these were people who were fighting for the maintenance of the British way of doing things, which I all, not only thought, I know, was always, uh, well, had a tendency to eschew emotion, avoid emotion on difficult subjects. These people were just allowing their emotions to rip. I shan't mention names because that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be polite. So, the question we need to ask ourselves is, um, well, one just final little point about um, the, uh, the kind of politics we're dealing with. This picture. Trump is to make British landing after Brexit D-Day. He's arriving the day after the Brexit referendum. Uh, it's an extraordinary political risk. I mean, if Brexit, if the vote goes for Brexit, he'll be able to uh, claim that uh, the world is going his way. But what will he do if the vote goes against Brexit? Goes for Remain on a big, on a, on a, in a big way. But this man obviously enjoys his politics very much. We've got someone like that in Poland too. He enjoys his politics too. And I think that there's a lot of, this is part of what is happening. For politicians, politics is a lot more fun. For you ordinary people, I think it'll be a lot less fun, I'm, I'm afraid. Well, you all know what's happened with Poland being charged yesterday with endangering the rule of law. And then there are two contrasting political cultures. I don't know how many of you watched uh, Commissioner Timmermans yesterday. Uh, Commissioner Timmermans managed to make something which was very dramatic sound about as boring as it could be. This is just another bureaucratic procedure which we go through. It's obviously not the case, but he thought this was a sensible thing to do, and I think it probably was a sensible thing to do. And then the other kind of European political culture that we have is this chap. Uh, for those of you who are Polish, you will know that uh, this is the Minister of Justice. And the Minister of Justice went, to, went on television and he said, only an idiot can't understand the difference between either and and. Because there were two laws, one which, sub, uh, which superseded the other, about uh, how candidates to, for justices to the Constitutional Tribunal are chosen, and uh, he claimed that it was obvious that these two laws had different meanings. In one case, the either case, it was that the presidium of the Polish parliament or a group of 50 MPs could uh, nominate a candidate. The other one, what, the other law said that, the, the later law said that, according to him, a group of 50 MPs, uh, sorry, the presidium of the same and a group of 50 MPs would need to nominate, we needed to nominate a candidate. Unfortunately, it so happens that the way the sentences are constructed in those two acts, in those two legal acts, uh, in the second one, it says the right to nominate a candidate inheres in or is granted to the presidium of the same and a group of 50 MPs. That doesn't mean together. But what is extraordinary if we're talking about political culture is if you can go on television and claim that words have a completely different meaning from what they would mean to somebody who reads them in a normal way and would expect to read them as ordinary sentences. You've clearly got a third problem, the problem of the collapse of a common political culture in a fundamental way. If words don't mean the same thing to people on different sides of the political divide, you're going to have a real problem. So, just to finish very briefly, um, what is causing this change? 
There is, uh, and I think that's part probably what our chairman would uh, think is the, um, is, would claim is the cause of this change. There is a view that, that I would call a social democratic view, a social democratic interpretation, and that is that people um, are shifting towards this kind of politics red in tooth and claw, this kind of aggressive politics, because they're poorer than they thought they should be, or they're poorer than they were, or they haven't done well, as well as they expected. Um, I have a problem with that, because the countries where we've seen this new politics succeed most strongly are actually the three countries that have done best during the crisis. That's to say, economically, that's to say Poland, the United States, and Britain. Now, things may get worse somewhere else later on, but that's a different matter. Uh, there's a conservative interpretation which says, and I tend towards this, that really things have been good for so long that people have simply forgotten how bad they can be. Now, this is very sad if it's true. Uh, I suspect it is. And there's a, a third uh, point which I think is worth, uh, worth stating very briefly, uh, but I've already spoken about it, and that is that in this context, politics becomes attractive to more interesting people. And when politics, it's a sort of self-enhancing, self-strengthening mechanism. When politics was basically about policies and rules, then boring people like one of the people I showed there um, tended to go into politics. Now that politics is becoming exciting, we're getting the Trumps of this world coming into politics and enjoying it very much, as well as some others. I'll, what will be the consequences? Well, I think the consequences for business will be dire, but I don't think most people here are particularly directly concerned with business, but they will be dire because you're going to suddenly have to worry about, people, about what people like me or some of these people are going to do next instead of having to worry about rules and laws and regulations. What are the consequences for nations going to be? Well, they're probably going to be pretty bad for most of the nations if things get worse. But the thing that I would like to stress is that they will be particularly bad for the smaller nations. Uh, there's a, a certain political trend in Poland where people like to say that, well, Poland is getting up off its knees. Well, I would just point out one thing. If you've got comparatively short people and comparatively big people all round in a circle on their knees, the differences between them will be smaller than when they stand up. And one of the problems that we have, of course, and we'll go back to my favorite. The chap on the right. He's running for president of a fairly large country. And what is his slogan? I'm going to make America, we're going to make America great again. Now the question is, who's got the better chance of getting up off their knees in that context? Thank you very much. Professor Oskowski, thank you very much indeed for a, a challenging and entertaining presentation. So, I think this has been very interesting. We're talking about things in a way, a very liberal, open way, in a way that we don't normally discuss politics and culture. We've had uh, four views. Uh, I think that Mr. Kemper and I are on the same side, uh, talking about European institutions and an ideal. Uh, Christian Davis gave a very elegant and intellectual analysis of, of Yugoslavia in relation to U the European political culture, which I uh, was arguing about the direction. And Professor Roskowski gave a novel insight, uh, and, and uh, uh, several things occur occurred to me about people and voting. So, I want to ask you now for questions to any of us about anything at all, have no inhibitions. Any question? Always difficult to get started. Yes, could you stand up, please? And we have an interpreter here. 
if you could. Uh... I'm Matos Matsin, political insight formerly University of Oxford, and I've got a question to Professor Rostovsky on how to tackle hypercritical use of the term political European political culture, because in recent years, say months, ever since the refugee crisis broke out, we've seen numerous instances of the term European political culture used in very different, say very oftentimes negative ways. Because if we see an influx of refugees from the Middle East or Northern Africa storming the borders of Europe, we oftentimes hear that they, we run the risk, if we accept them all, we run the risk of them making a terrorist attack or an, a direct attack on the European political culture, referring to it as if it was a joint, coherent concept shared among all the European countries. But on the other hand, when we hear... Short question. Yeah, sure. Uh, when we discuss you, the unity of the European Union and we hear far-right populists referring to the European Union, they oftentimes say that in terms of political culture, Poland, for example, differs significantly from Spain, from Netherlands, or from the Nordic countries, as if it wasn't, again, a, a joint coherent concept. So how to tackle hypocrisy in terms of referring to European political culture? Well, I actually think the question's at least as much to Christian Davis as it is to me, but quite frankly. I would say the following, in spite of everything, there are certain things that are very European in culture and in political culture. One of the things that is very European is the importance of the rule of law. Um, that goes right back to ancient Rome and even to Athens. <coughs> uh, you can't have democracy without a constitutional framework, right? You can't even have constitutional democracy, a monarchy, sorry, without a constitutional framework. So I think that's certainly European. Um, <clears throat> I'm not aware of similar constructs in the other great uh, civilizations, of human civilizations. Um, it's more a matter of internalizing certain principles, for instance, in Confucianism in China. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, very often there's just the principle of the absolute sovereignty of the ruler. Um, so I think that's very European, very special. Uh, and I think that, that that has a right to be called European political culture. Um, but. In a wider sense, I agree with, uh, with Christian Davis. You know, we've got to take, and I said that, we've got to take the bad with the, with the good. We can't cherry pick. We have to take responsibility for the bad bits. And we have to define what we think is bad and be willing to stand up and be counted and argue and, if necessary, fight against it. Yeah. Yeah, I think... Uh Mateusz has got to the core of the problem, which is that different people have different interpretations of what is European and what, what, is, uh, um, what is inherently European or not. One, one distinction, which I think is extremely...